Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by, for the second time, by University of Chicago Law Professor Will Bode, uh, Director of the, Constitu- Con- uh, the Constitutional Law Institute at Chicago Law School, author of many important works, uh, both for more popular audiences and for his fellow legal scholars. Uh, constitutional liquidation uh, is something I really want to talk to him about at some point on a conversation, but every time we schedule one of these conversations, there's so much to talk about that's happening in the real world for now that Madison and constitutional liquidation gets shoved aside, but we will do that. We will do that sometime soon. Uh, will uh, uh, has an excellent podcast, um, Divided Argument, with his colleague Dan Epps, and you should listen to that and read everything he writes. Will, thanks for, for joining me again today. Thanks for having me. And uh, we had a good conversation a year ago, which I highly recommend to people because it stands up very well. Uh, you were worried, you said you were alarmed, but not alarmist, but still worried of the, that the peaceful transfer of power can no longer be taken for granted. We focused on the whole question of the peaceful transfer of power, election denial and so forth, election subversion. Uh, but you said we blew through a lot more of the safeguards than people expected. So it's a year later now. Uh, Things have happened in the political world and uh, legislatively things may be about to happen on the Electoral Count Act and there have been some judicial developments. How worried are you? I just want to get to the current state of the Supreme Court more broadly in the last term and the next term in a a few minutes, but just on the question of sort of uh, the peaceful transfer of power and recognizing the victors in elections, are you more worried, less worried than you were a year ago? I mean, is it possible to be more and less worried at the same time? Totally. That's that's much of life is that way, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so on, on the one hand, you know, one of the things I was worried about is that this was going to sort of catch us by surprise the way it sort of did uh, in 2020. Um, and that just a lot of, you know, the institutions weren't really kind of uh, coup proofed. Um, and I'm less worried about that now in the sense that I think... We've made a lot of attention to it. You know, you see people in Congress, you see Electoral Count Act reform maybe going to happen, which we can talk about. Um, So I'm less worried that we're sort of uh, not taking this seriously. But uh, at the same time, it seems like it's not going away. It seems like if we were hoping there was going to be a kind of broad bipartisan consensus that uh, we don't try to steal elections, I'm not sure we've gotten there. Yeah, so so the political situation is not improved. So maybe the safeguards are a little, if, if the elect, I assume a, a, an electoral count, some version of the Senate and House uh, electoral count act, you know, they'll compromise or whatever and or accept one or the other. And you think that's a pretty good thing, some strengthening of the safeguards from what you know of the current legislation? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there are two aspects to it. So one is kind of the formal legal technicalities, uh, which are pretty good um, and which sort of uh, close some loopholes and, you know, change some numbers and um, kind of make things work a little better. Uh but the other is just the fact that it's possible. Uh, and that's, I guess I won't, you know, I'll hold my breath until it passes. Uh, but the fact that we're inching towards a sort of broad bipartisan consensus in the Senate, um, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. Yeah, I've been I've been talking to some of the people involved in it and I, they, were all, they get slightly obsessed, of course, on, I don't really like this provision and that bill and, you know, shouldn't it be a third of the, like a third of the objectors instead of a fifth or should it be, how could we really you know, foolproof it against state legislatures causing trouble. And I, I think you probably can't ultimately foolproof these things, right? You can straighten the safeguards some, but just the the bipartisan act of passing this legislation will have its own effect on the political culture, maybe, or maybe not. I mean, yeah, hopefully. And hopefully, you know, so one of the, uh, you know, one of the key points that held last time, but that, that could have been close was sort of what was Mike Pence going to do, right? Because the position of the vice president was kind of ambiguous. And if he'd stood up and started trying to delay the count, you know, I just, I don't know what would have happened. Um, the Electoral Count Act sort of takes the firm position that that's not his role. Now, would that stop a vice president who thinks, no, I have the constitutional role to count the votes and, and do whatever I want? Obviously, he could say the statute's unconstitutional, but it probably makes it a lot easier for uh, the next vice president, the next vice president to say, you know, look, uh, I'm just following the, the path here. And how much do you think we're sort of ultimately still, though, in this and as in other cases in our democracy, uh, as some people have put it, on the honor system? I mean, how much can these safeguards be really structurally, you know, strengthened and, and to resist bad actors? And how much at some point do you just have to have a limited number of bad actors? Yeah, I mean, look, the whole country is on the honor system. It always has been. Uh, that's sort of um, the nature of constitutional government is you recognize that everything's on the honor system, but you try to set up enough – 
uh, different people and enough different structures that you're not you're not putting one person uh, too much to the test too much of the time. And that's sort of what I think is going on here. But in terms of the overall political culture, and I guess we're talking mostly really about Trump and, and that side of the Republican Party, it doesn't seem that thing. It's not less respectable today in electoral politics, at least in Republican electoral politics, at least in Republican primary electoral politics, to be pretty frank about you know the, what happened in twenty the January six should have succeeded, and we'll do it again if we if we feel we need to. Yeah, that's my impression. Again, as I was sort of hoping we'd get to the point where it was sort of a, a taboo to say, you know, I won't respect the election. And now it seems like it's like the the macho thing to do to say, like, of course I'm gonna. Um, you know, now maybe that's all bluster. Uh, maybe people just sort of say that as their way of signaling that they're on the the Trumpy wing of the Republican Party. Uh, that's my hope, but I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not yet done worrying. And the courts, which were important in 2020, I think, just to repeat, less any. Perhaps I'm sure you could say which particular decisions were important, but from just the, the outside as a non-lawyer, just the steady drumbeat of, of the election deniers losing in in court, mostly federal court, I guess some state courts too, was helpful, I think, in delegitimizing the effort. Do you feel the courts and legal doctrines remain sort of pro-election, uh, uh, respecting? Uh, and, and Yeah, I still think the court is one of our healthiest uh, branches of government. Um uh, they're not going to save us, right? If the if we get to the point where a, a huge number of sort of election deniers sort of seize power, the Supreme Court is not going to like unilaterally stop a coup. Uh, but they're not going to help, and they're probably going to increase some friction because they still take this law stuff pretty seriously. Well, that's good to hear. So let's so let's talk about the courts because I guess one question though is if the courts are important and if the courts themselves become the object of huge political, um, you know, pulling and uh, hauling and pulling, whatever the metaphor is, um, expression is, that itself then damages one of the institutions that's had the most credibility, I think, and, and been most effective in supporting the constitutional democracy. So where do we stand, do you think? I mean, is, is it was a pretty unusual term. It's one that certainly law professors will be teaching about for a long time, I think. Uh, with, and Roe, of course, in particular, Dobbs, the decision overturning Roe after almost 50 years. Uh, where are you in I mean, Where do we stand in terms of the Supreme Court and uh, sort of where are we going, do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, the Supreme Court had one of the most dramatic terms and probably is not going to stop there, particularly. You know, I think there's always regression toward the mean, so next term probably won't be as big as last term but but i don't think uh i don't think it's a one-off either um i'm not I, i'm not as worried about the the long-term health of the court as maybe a lot of people are i think the court is still you know very serious uh and trying very hard to work out these kind of basic principles of of constitutional law but there are going to be some big cases still to come so talk a little about those cases and uh, what, what where do you expect the next big controversies to come? This seems to me to make a big difference to have one controversial decision, but ultimately one that a lot of people was overturning a decision that a lot of people thought was problematic and so forth, or to have it just a series where people start to think, you know, they're just sort of out of control and out of touch with the electorate. They're supposed to be counter-majoritarian, I understand, but there's counter-majoritarian and then there's really counter-majoritarian, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, although, so there's a funny thing, I'll just say, you know, as a point of historical context, you think of like the New Deal era was a time right. we had a really counter-majoritarian court and obviously the closest we ever came to, to serious uh, court packing, you know, in the 20th century. But what was happening there was con was the court was repeatedly striking down like popular acts of Congress. Um, Congress was acting, and the Supreme Court was saying no. So it was sort of standing athwart the most democratic, you know, most powerful branch in the in the government. And that's not what the court's doing. You know, in part, I mean, Congress and the president aren't uh, unified enough to pass a lot of major legislation uh, outside of the kind of tax and spending context. And so the things the court is doing are just are in a way more modest. I mean, the they matter a lot. We hear this in the headlines, but it's it's not like the Supreme Court struck down uh, the Affordable Care Act. You know, even the most recent challenge they had to do that uh, was seven to two, and and you know maybe not even really two. Uh, so I think it's it's important to see the court is not being as kind of majoritarian as it could. And for instance, like one of the biggest cases on the docket uh, for next term is obviously the court's affirmative action cases um, about the affirmative action programs at Harvard and North Carolina. And that, you know, the court will probably invalidate their admissions programs, and that'll make a lot of uh, 
court watchers and, and journalists very upset. But it'll probably be popular. Like, <laughs> uh, in the scheme of things, the court might actually build up some credibility uh, just in terms of where public opinion is. Yeah, I am struck that a lot of the commentary does distinguish, as you just very helpfully did, between you know, overturning congressional laws and overturning their own precedents uh, that were perhaps always controversial or, or overturning applications of laws, but letting Congress then fix it. I think that's an important safety valve, right? I mean, they, uh, at which that sort of distinction has been lost. Some they can they over they threw out various uh, EPA had over you know too much discretion, I guess, to put it in layman's terms. You know, when when they uh, expanded the Clean Act, Clean Air Act, as much as they did under President Obama. On the other hand, so clearly they, I think, clearly Congress left. The court left the door open to Congress to say, no, we want to pass legislation that allows the EPA to regulate this, this, and this. And if they just say they that that's the purpose, that's that's constitutional, right? I mean, so there is a – is that generally the character you think a lot of what they're doing? I think that's right. So, I, you know, I think um, – yeah, if Congress wants to step in and sort of patch the holes in the administrative state or, or even, you know, make policy itself, just <laughs> decide what we should do about climate change – uh, I think the court would defer to that. Um, so in a way, it's a symptom of the the general uh, decay and fracturing of our institutions that we sort of, we just forget about that. We assume that's off the table. Like, obviously, Congress is not going to do this. The question is whether our uh, administrative agencies will do it. Um, I think the court is, you know, putting the, the ball back in in the people's court a little bit. Now, I suppose, insofar as the court's finding these as constitutional rights or prohibitions, as would be the case, I guess, in the affirmative action cases. Those will be, those will be Fourteenth Amendment cases, not uh, not violations of congressional law. So that does close the door to, I guess, public and or private uh, universities doing certain things. So that's a little more dramatic. Do you think? That's right. So that that's a little more dramatic. Um, uh, again, it's it's more in line with a lot of of public opinion, for better or worse. Uh, I'm not sure the court should care that much of public opinion but but it's there um there are some arguments in the case that are going to be more statutory you know so so one of the kind of uh looming facts of this area is that the the Six civil rights act passed by congress you know has an explicit ban on taking race into account uh and the court read that to allow affirmative action but but one of the arguments in the case is maybe they should just decide it on kind of statutory grounds uh, i don't think that'll happen but there are still ways that that it could be even more in the in the democratic category what other areas do you think the court will cause an uproar in in the next year or two because it, um no. yeah well so, so two others that i think are are in this category of the things most to watch for right? the court's going to sort of you know hold things unconstitutional maybe take them off the off the table uh one is the the kind of recurring conflict between anti-discrimination law and uh free speech free exercise so they have a, a recurrence of this question that, that came before them a couple years ago in masterpiece cake shop uh, about whether there's a, a right to opt out from anti-discrimination law. This time it's a custom wedding website designer um, who doesn't want to design websites for um, gay weddings. And that's, you know, that's obviously the court stepping into a kind of culture war problem and, and stopping some uh, states and localities from, from imposing discrimination norms. And that, that hits a lot of culture war buttons. So I think that's going to be, uh, and that's probably a long simmering issue of the court. Uh, the other one, which relates to something we talked about earlier, is, is election law. Um, so there is a case uh, that resurrects some doctrines that were at issue in the 2020 election and at issue in the 2000 election of Bush versus Gore uh, that people call the independent state legislature doctrine, which sounds weird, but which goes to kind of some fundamental questions of federalism and states' abilities to, to control their own elections. Yeah, so let's, let's come back to that in just one second, because that is very important and I think does tie together the different parts of our conversation. But on the religious, I've always thought, but maybe I'm just wrong, that the religious freedom stuff was... Uh, controversial, of course, and and difficult. Probably, it's a matter of actual judging, and or from my point of view, of even thinking about what the right outcome is, leaving aside in a way the constitutional arguments, as if it were subject to legislation. But but it does seem somewhat on the margins. No, I mean that you know, if some people are exempted from having to do certain things, we're not getting right to the you know, the bulk of the country will chug along in certain paths that are pretty well set or am I uh, underestimating how controversial these religious liberty cases could be? I, I mean, I do think it depends on how far they go, right? So the, the more and more every person has a kind of religious opt out from every government program, the harder it is to do things. We saw this uh, in the many, many cases about, you know, COVID responses and vaccines and 
uh, shutdowns. And in a way, right, in a way, maybe you say, well, look, it just doesn't really matter if ultimately if some people don't comply, you know, we're dealing with, with the majorities here. Um, but, you know, the further it goes, the, the bigger effect it has. But I think part of it may just be symbolic. So maybe this is agreeing with you. It's, it's not always about policy. Um, you know, most people can find a custom wedding website designer uh, even if the first person or the second person turns them down for whatever reason, there, there are a lot of website designers on the internet. Uh, but it seems to be the, the kind of the emotional and like, uh, symbolic stakes seem to be really high. And that's putting the court in a kind of awkward place where it's being asked to pick sides between the right and the left. And I suppose those cases are more controversial if you're forcing Yeshiva University to take a case that's now uh, to do something as opposed to exempt, well, exempting people from having to do things or maybe not maybe the as you say that the exemptions become broad enough they itself become a, it itself becomes a kind of big culture war matter it's always hard to tell sort of what counts as the as the neutral position and what doesn't you know so right. yeshiva would say we just want to be left alone to uh, pursue our own vision of torah but then the students say no <laughs> here we are at yeshiva we want to be <laughs> able to pursue our own vision um and that's part of where you end up with these kind of zero sum uh zero sum conflicts and federal funds are being used for you know, yeshiva and so forth. So there are plenty of reasons why you could argue that uh, it's not simply a private actor doing something on his own time, so to speak. Right? Yeah, I mean, this is a, uh, one of the sort of one of the problems with the 21st century uh, regulatory state, right? Is there there is no there's nothing that's kind of totally free from government regulation and totally free from government subsidy. So we're we're all kind of entangled in the state to some degree, right? And some of the I guess, and that does make I mean some of these decisions are difficult as a matter, I suppose, of line drawing, right? Anyway, it's always going to end up looking to people from on the outside who want to be critical and to make fun of most of the courts. Oh, look at this arbitrary thing. They've got a two-step test here and a four-part test here. And a, but of course, how at some point that's, it's going to have to be like that, right? If it, unless they're simply going to, you know, go 100% one way or the other in some of these murky areas. Yeah, exactly. Area, yeah. Conflicting areas, I guess, maybe. Yeah, and, th and this is part of what gets to like the, the court's broader role, right? Is that we end up uh, in constitutional law giving the courts all the problems that we uh, are too conflicted about to, to just settle you know, completely democratically. And then the Supreme Court ends up getting the hardest of those cases, <laughs> the ones that the, the lower courts disagree about or where they, you know, we can't quite iron out a clear rule. So if you ask the Supreme Court every year to resolve some of the most controversial social issues in the country, it's unsurprising that at the end we yell at them for not doing it the way we all want it. I mean, we sort of moved very quickly past Rose and, and Dobbs, so let me come back to that for a minute. I mean, what what happens politically happens politically, I suppose, and states will make their decisions. And um, does that come back to the courts in a big way, or is that now really a, a political fight in both at the state and federal level? I do think uh, constitutional abortion rights are going to come back to the court a lot. Um, you know, they they we're trying to sort of settle the row question, right? Not, not proceed by half steps, not say 15 weeks is okay, but 13 weeks is not okay in the hopes I think of, of kind of settling this once and for all and taking it off their docket. But there are just a, a lot of other constitutional questions surrounding this that'll come up. Like, uh, can Congress act if Congress decides to pass a national abortion ban or a national right to abortion? Is that within Congress's enumerated powers? Or how do the states interact? You know, when you travel from one state to another, which state controls what parts of it? Um, I think there are going to be cases about the money because you see a lot of uh, attempts to you know give funds to support people to get an abortion or travel to get an abortion, and then we're going to have a lot of you know questions about is money sort of is money protected by the Constitution? Is it something you can regulate? Um, and probably more, depending on how aggressive the, the states want to be. I mean, I was somewhat surprised, even after the draft opinion leaked by uh, Alito's opinion in Roe, but I mean, you feel free to convince me that I'm wrong, that in the sense that I just feel like as a matter of kind of court, of institutional uh, self-protection by the court, and, and not just protection, but kind of uh, appropriateness, let's just call it, uh, from a kind of old-fashioned conservative, you know, Frankfurt or Alex Bickle-ish type point of view, I don't know. Throwing out a 49-year-old uh, case, pretty that's been affirmed in the meantime, and obviously is you know very much part of the country's fabric. Five to four. Uh, it was six-three technically, I guess, was Roberts concurred in the decision, but I mean five-four in terms of overturning Roe. With a five-four decision, 
with three judges put on by the most recent president, one of them very controversially eight days before his uh, election day in 2020, it just feels like that's asking for trouble in a way that a 7-2 decision in Roe itself with judges from appointed by Republican and Democratic presidents on both sides, obviously 9-0 on Brown v. Board. There have been some very controversial 5-4 decisions, but pretty rare, actually, in the big ones like this. And... Uh, I don't know. Am I wrong? I was very sympathetic to Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence, if that's the right term for concurrence slash dissent or whatever. But um, on the other hand, maybe that just would have kicked the can down the road and been no solution at all. I don't know. So uh, I'm just curious how much do you think the the particular way in which it was done made a difference? Or was it just always going to be wildly controversial one way or the other? So Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say, first of all, I don't think there's any uncontroversial way to overrule Roe versus Wade. Uh, I don't think, you know, slowly, quickly, 5 4, 7 2, uh, I think they're all going to be controversial. Um, and the same thing, you know, Justice Alito wrote a very long opinion going into detail about, you know, every historical mistake made in Roe versus Wade. And some people criticize that tone. But I don't think if he'd done it, you know, in 10 pages, Brown versus Board of Education style, that people would be impressed with his statesmanship. So in that sense, that's just kind of the, the position the court's in. And, you know, look, Obergefell was five to four, uh, yeah. making a, a big transformation in laws across the country and uh, overturning precedent to do it. And uh, but, you know, now there the court happened to be kind of uh, in line with the trend in public opinion, especially elite public opinion, a little better. So so there wasn't as much hand wringing. Um, but that was a big case, too. And in some ways, a bigger case. Right. Because that took it off the took the question off the table everywhere. Whereas Roe puts the question on the table everywhere. I mean, Dobbs. No, that's a good point. I mean, it was in line with the trend in legislatures as well. So it was a little less, whereas this one either yeah. was or wasn't, you couldn't tell. I mean, we don't know yet which what the real trend is in yeah. terms of legislation. But I agree. No, Obergefell is, 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 comes to <clears> mind as the one, the biggest 5-4 decision the, that, that fits into that pattern, I suppose. But, but then standing back from both, you could say, geez, are we going to have a court that's now going to go 5-4? on very fundamental questions with part, let's just call it partisan decisions in the sense that the judges are all on the side of whoever, whichever pre president or whichever party put them on the court. Um, yeah. That's not kind of ultimately very good for the court, is it? Uh, no, it's not good for the court. Uh, I mean, it's not quite clear what the individual justices are supposed to do about it. Uh, <laughs> right. you, know, you, don't, you don't see uh, Justice Kagan uh, joining the majority in Dobbs to help, help the court's legitimacy either. Uh, you know, she's, She's not going to switch sides just to make things seem more legitimate, just as the conservatives won't. Yeah. I think one, one other difference about Dobbs that might make it a one-off is just how much energy was sort of pent up for so long. You know, Roe wasn't controversial the day it was decided, but it quickly became controversial, and then Casey was controversial, and then for decades, there's just been so much kind of interest group, political energy, you know, emotion built up around this issue that then when it, when it you know, finally happens, it sort of all comes pouring out in some ways that's the, the consequence of doing it slowly uh is that we've built up just you know more fervor over this issue than almost any other political issue so i suppose the question going forward is i mean yeah how much this was kind of a one-off and we, we go sort of back to something resembling normal though normal in our current polarized politics isn't quite normal in night of it maybe if the politics of the uh, 50s or 70s maybe more like the 30s and uh so i'm curious yeah i mean which Maybe affirmative act, but I don't, yeah, if you have affirmative action this year, what about the independent state legislature doctrine? How, how far will the courts go in yeah. letting state legislatures decide not to simply rubber stamp popular vote results in their states? Yeah. So I mean, I, th I think Dobbs is this indication that the court, the court is less incrementalist, cares less about public opinion, cares less about precedent than maybe a lot of people are are used to. Um, and so that's going to be true in every case. That doesn't mean they'll go as far as they can in every case. Um, so in independent state legislatures, you know, there are kind of the most radical position would be that uh, state legislatures can do whatever they want and nothing in the state constitutions and nothing in any other part of the government uh, can control them. And they'll really sort of be sort of wholly unchained. Uh, I doubt the court uh, will go that far. In part, I doubt they'll think they need to. And I suspect as they look at it, They'll find even just sort of the historical and textual case for going that far is is not as strong as it seems. I think they'll do something. And there's sort of a range of of intermediate positions um, that the court may take to say, look, 
state courts, you can't just get away with anything you want either. You can't just call this constitutional interpretation and then and then take over the process. Uh, but at the same time, we're not saying that that state legislatures are just sort of like totally out out uh, unchained. And presumably, like, the court could, for example, say you can't change the law after November eighth or whatever election day is. Right? That sort of would be one safeguard so that's already uh that's already sort of built into the the constitution is that the constitution says that congress gets to pick the date for the selection of presidential electors and then if the the new electoral count act amendments pass they you know clarify even more you know what that means and that means that any sort of everything has to be judged by the rules that were in place at the time at the time things happened so i'm not so worried about about independent state legislatures having an impact on that kind of shenanigans um, I think one of the big questions is, is more like things like partisan gerrymandering, which the Supreme Court has said are not a federal constitutional matter, but are up to the states. Well, how much are the states allowed to do something about it? Right. So in the North Carolina case, the North Carolina Supreme Court concluded that the legislature was engaging in partisan gerrymandering under state law. Normally, that would just be something we would leave to the states. And the legislature is trying to get the Supreme Court to sort of step in and give them a constitutional right to gerrymander. Um, which would be, you know, uh, I think a little bit corrosive for our, our political institutions if there is such a right. Yeah, I would think so. And I would think, I mean, just, so if the court has this in-between position on independent state legislatures, but seems to okay a certain amount of flexibility, uh, let's say, and then um, Carrie Lake is the governor of Arizona and they have Republican majorities, I'm making this up obviously, but, you know, and they decide to pass a law that says vaguely, presumably, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Larity's, the state legislature, we ahead of time say that the state legislature can reconvene and uh, take actions to deal with these irregularities in terms of who the electors, which slate of electors is sent. And that seems to sort of be, I don't know, I mean, could, could one imagine a dynamic whereby late 2024, before election day, we're looking at genuine possibility, I mean, real turmoil in the sense of what's going to happen again, or this gets back to our original discussion, sort of how much the guardrails, could we be unstrengthening some guardrails at the same time that we've strengthened others? Yeah, I think that's possible. I mean, I think there, there are several steps there. So it'll depend on the federal statutes, not just the constitution and the Arizona legislature won't get any power over interpreting the federal statutes. So you do have the federal courts acting there as watchdog, but you know, an additional guardrail would have been the Arizona Supreme Court, and maybe the independent state legislature doctrine will slightly diminish the power of the Arizona Supreme Court. Maybe another way to think of it concretely for 2024 is if this election is within the kind of the close margins, the margin of shenanigans, uh, where a little bit of, of trouble can swing the election, the Supreme Court may well be asked to resolve it. Um, and they, you know, managed to sort of duck it last time in part because the election wasn't that close in the end. Um, but we may not be so lucky in 2024. Yeah, that's interesting. That's what worries me. I mean, I guess just on the broader question of the court, I'm struck that you say they're going to more or less aggressively, but sort of chug ahead on the path they're on. I mean, after Roe v. Wade, now you, you know the history much better than I. I remember it. I'm older than you know. He is so I, I, in real time, so to speak, uh, watching it. Um, people like me who were kind of conservative and sort of proto-originalist, I suppose you might say, on, on court interpretation issues, we thought, oh my God, we're going to have a huge crisis and we need to all be writing, you know, explaining the, the, the alternative, the conservative alternative to this kind of out of control war and or post-war in court, uh, you know, liberal jurisprudence, um, living constitution. But then the court did pull back in important ways, I think, in practically important ways. I don't know if the cases were that important. In 75, as I recall, they sort of didn't go ahead as it looked like they might and, and, and require uh, inter-district busing for the sake of racial balance in schools. And then on the death penalty, which they had decided to find unconstitutional, although I guess it's mentioned twice in the Constitution, I think, uh, they kind of reversed themselves. They, I don't know if they literally reversed themselves, but they basically reopened the door to the death penalty. Maybe that was around 76. And I remember thinking, I was in grad school writing a little bit about the courts at that time, uh, taking a law school class or two, and thinking yeah, they've sort of prudentially pulled back from the brink. And then Carter had no appointments, and then Reagan had uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and anyone. And sort of, I think the steam went out of the except for the particular issue of abortion in Roe, which the steam does not go out of, but in the more broader sense of it's out of control, it's this is not counter-majoritarianism, this is just like legislating from the bench, and let's, it didn't become a central, it sort of faded a bit as a central issue politically. Uh, but it doesn't sound to me like you're saying the courts are going to 
pull back quite in that way, but maybe I've got the history wrong a little bit too. I don't know. So, okay. So I think one thing's similar, one thing's different. So the thing that's different is that the court, the justices are really have a real theory of law and they really believe in it. Yeah. And I think in a way, I mean, that, that sounds, that sounds sort of anodyne, but, but in a way that actually can mean the court's more radical because once you're sure, you know what the constitution requires, you're a little more willing to just the, you see the precedents as real problems. You see public opinion as something you can't kind of bow to. So I think the court's uh, sure of itself in a way that maybe wasn't as true back in the day. Um, and that's a difference. I do think there's still a kind of level setting that happens. So when you get a new majority, uh, there are a bunch of precedents that are out of step with what the new majority thinks. And so the first few years, there's a kind of uh, a calling to accounts where you kind of overrule a lot of things, kind of change the basic place of doctrine. But then once you've done that, you know, then there just there aren't as many uh, big changes to make in the short run. So it's not quite that the it's not quite that the court runs out of steam. It's that we hit the new normal. Um, so like like the Second Amendment case from last term uh, is the, is radical. It's the first time you know the courts really uh, applied the Second Amendment to limit gun control outside of the home, and that's obviously what people care about most because uh, we spend a lot of our times with other people outside of our homes. But you know. On its face, the court says, well, look, this is what we're doing. And Justice Kavanaugh says, we're not necessarily going to imperil um, the concealed carrier regimes in a lot of states, but we're going to have a kind of level set where we get used to what laws are okay, what laws aren't okay. But we're not necessarily just going to keep going, you know, until we reach the Wild West. Yeah, I guess it a lot depends on how far they go, practically how, what it feels to people like how, in terms of how far they're they're going in, in sort of these areas and whether at some point you just never know, right? Whether there's a kind of tipping point where it's sort of, you can do this in one or two areas, but you're doing it in on abortion and you're doing it in on guns and you're doing it on maybe election, you know, how elections yeah. are going to be determined and you're doing it on affirmative action. And I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to tell ahead of time, of course, what that feels like politically right. and, and whether people emerge as po politicians emerge uh, in this case, we normally more on the left than the right, but you know, to say this is, you know, it is time to think about radical remedies, and we need radical remedies because we have a radical, out of control court. Yeah, but I mean, you think of the Warren court; like they did desegregation and election law reform, one person, one vote, and totally reformed the way the criminal justice system works in a ton of ways, and expanded Congress's power. And you know, again, those things all kind of petered out in the end. But but the the core accomplishments are still there. Uh, like a lot of those doctrines changed, and people got used to them. And we might, I mean, we might be in for a new Warren court. I mean, it might be a lot of, a lot of changes in a lot of areas and we'll have to see how people get used to them. And it was a big political issue. I mean, for Republicans and for Nixon, I mean, people make fun yeah. of the John Birch Society and Peter Warren, but I mean, it was a real issue in 68, for example, that, you know, we need tough, you know, a president who will appoint tough on crime judges and so forth. And, you know, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the thing. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying nothing big is going to happen, um, but it, it has precedent. The, the thing that's different now that I that I don't know what to make of is I think the you know the level of sort of elite structural criticism of the court seems a little different you know so it's not yeah. the John Birch Society saying impeach Earl Warren right it's Larry Tribe saying pack the Supreme Court that we've gone from it's not just like oh the court got this wrong the court got that wrong but like the whole thing is rotten and we have to throw it out and I don't know where that goes. And that's part of, don't you think, a broader polarization that's not just of the public, but of elites too, where, so I, I do think, I mean, you mentioned this, that Justice Kagan obviously didn't decide to join the opinion to give it more legitimacy, but I mean, Chief Justice Berger probably did actually write uh, sure. right row, right row in order to give it more legitimacy, but also to limit it sort of in some ways, or give it to Blackman to write, I guess, um, and, and make sure and then join the opinion. And, and so it is a different mood, it feels to me, not just among the judges, among the, uh, as you say, the, the, the elite commentariat, I guess, among elite law professors too. I mean. Definitely, definitely. Um, and it, it relates, it's a little bit of the, I mean, not to, not to make this about both sides, but it's a little bit of the, the, the fuzzy mirror image of some of the election stuff we've been talking about, right? So you can't just lose a Supreme Court case now. You lose it and you have to pack the court and say the court is corrupt and illegitimate. And you can't just lose a presidential election now. You lose it and it has to have been stolen and the whole thing, you know, it's like everything has to get uh, leveled up. So we can't just take our, our wins and losses and kind of keep going like normal, but we have to turn it into a, uh, a fight the system moment. I mean, as someone who's sort of on the conservative side of most of these things for most of my uh, you know, adult life, I guess I am a little struck, but again, tell me if you think I'm overreacting to this, that uh, 
originalism was supposed to be a kind of uh, bounding of the court, I mean, against the living constitution or whatever, right? And, and then we go back and we kind of get back into a really grounded set of interpretations based on, and then there are many complicated issues of original intent and what's intent and textualism, but leave all that, and I don't even, haven't even kept up with that, those debates, you know them all extremely well, but leave that aside for a minute. But I think it was supposed to be a kind of uh, stabilizing doctrine, though it could, everyone understood it would have radical, could have radical interpretations implications in the short term and overturning a bunch of precedents. The degree to which I do feel like even among conservative judges, certainly lower courts, a few lower court judges, maybe the justices too, certainly Thomas, I'd say maybe Alito, have just, originalism now seems to be this uh, weapon to be wielded, not to re, I mean, it's just, it just wipes out, you know, obviously in the case of Roe, 50 years, in the gun cases, arguably 100 years of precedents, uh, legislative precedents or court precedents. And it, and it is somewhat arbitrary. And, and it doesn't seem that grounded or that limited because guess what? You get to then decide, well, it's, it's, it's the, it turns out it's not really originalism. It's kind of the historical understanding of the time. So they're all going to become amateur historians. And that is that really any more limiting than, you know, Warren or Douglas deciding what, what whatever the phrases we all made fun of when I was, you know, put up with deciding what the penumbras of different inter- amendments were. So I do feel that the conservative side of it is less, has less of the advantage the conservatism sometimes does have of, of feeling more prudent and incremental and uh, frankly defensible in a certain way, you know, in, in, in constitutional law. But if I overstated that. Well, so I think this was always there in originalism. So I think one of the, before before even your time, the most famous originalist on the Supreme Court was Hugo Black. Yeah. Uh, who was, a you know, the sort of absolutist on free speech, who sort of led the charge to incorporate tons of rights against the states, including the criminal procedure revolution, you know, who was a... a uh, had really radical views and who would ground these who would do amateur history where he would go through the congressional globe and produce a long appendix with the original meaning of the privileges or immunities clause that you know prompted law professors to write books in response uh that kind of radicalism i think has always been there i i do think that there was this time period where the court was so was seen as so kind of liberal and activist and out of step that you could be both both originalism and judicial restraint were kind of like two two uh themes together right and but those were always actually kind of intention i think and now now the tensions become clear (laughs) and so maybe the um the party has to split up a little bit but the tension arguably you know i think that's very true about the tension and certainly smart observers and analysts said these are ultimately different but you could also argue the tension made it more palatable and more manageable in a certain way as an actual you know year to year kind of making of decisions uh process yeah. You know. yeah no i think this is part of how this is in the, on the politics side this is sort of in the nature of, of coalitions right you think maybe to the same thing of you know fusionism in the republican party that for a long time we could put the social conservatives and the libertarians together and that kind of moderated them both and approved them both but at some point um at some point those tensions come to a head uh and maybe we don't always like who wins but it does sound to me as if you're saying this is very interesting i haven't really thought about this i mean that you, you know we're gonna have it's going to be choppy, right or wrong, right thing or not. We're we're not going into uh, we're 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 staying in choppy waters, or the ship is continuing to not avoid the difficult uh, passages, or whatever metaphor you want, <laughs> for the next few years at least. Do you think? I mean, just the nature yeah. of the thing and the way they're thinking is going to. We're not settling down. Yeah, that's right. We're we're not hitting the iceberg, but it's not smooth sailing. Uh, it's not smooth sailing either. Um, and of course, as advocates get a better sense of what you know kinds of cases to press, sometimes that'll that'll take us new places too. The, that said, the other thing is you know it just takes a little bit of chance to change things a lot. You know, a uh, couple of close elections or a couple of issues of the justice's health, and some t- suddenly you know it seems like a big change again. Uh, it's kind of uh, macabre to speculate, but but it you don't know exactly how long this is going to happen. Um, and maybe that also affects the court, right? If you, if you're, if you're on the current majority and you don't know exactly how, how permanent the current situation is, you know, then you might not be eager to, to hold your fire or take your time. You might think now's the time to, to get things as right as we can. Yeah. I think the question is the broader public. And I 
by which I would include senators and presidential candidates and stuff, do they look at all this? They look at some of these individual district, federal district judges uh, embracing fairly radical versions of doctrines, uh, both in the left in the past, and that was the people like me were always unhappy about Ninth Circuit and all this, but, uh, and, and now the right now. And um, as I say, the originalism becomes a, seems to sort of justify not a kind of steady path to consensus, but but the opposite. And um, and then and the, you have these injunctions to, that one judge can join something, apparently, I guess, for the whole country, and that seems a little crazy. And then you can have judge shopping, and then you get, yeah, I don't know, it, just, it all feels a little bit together to be producing a situation where it's not going to be like beyond the pale for presidential candidates, respectable presidential candidates to endorse things in terms of court reform. So let's talk about that a minute since you were on the Biden commission on, on this, um, that we all would have been really ruled out by both sides, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, no, I, th- I think that's all, that's all true. Uh, and you know, there are sort of, there are healthier versions of that instinct and less healthy versions. So, uh, should Congress pass nationwide injunction reform? Definitely, right? That they, they actually, this is a problem we had 100 years ago when uh, uh, federal courts first started issuing kind of dramatic injunctions against state laws. And Congress for a long time required you to go to a three judge panel before you can get an injunction. And there are all these kind of procedural reforms. And over time, those changed. And it may be time to, to go back and, and kind of try to rein in the court's power a little bit in a bipartisan way. Um, that would be good. Is that happening? I mean, if you is there people even introducing such legislation? It seems like a sensible thing to me. But. Yeah, there have been there have been some hearings about it. Um, you know, it has the it has the problem that at any given time it's a partisan issue, but the partisanship flips every time. So the uh, the uh, liberals wanted to be able to issue nationwide injunctions against Donald Trump, and now the conservatives want to be issue, able to issue them against Joe Biden, and so it requires a little bit of perspective. But there have been but there have been some hearings. There's been some legislation introduced. I'm not. I'm not holding my breath. I think Justice Kagan just came out and and made some remarks about how this really isn't sustainable, and and you know something needs to be done about it. Maybe the court could do it. Uh, that would be good. Uh, the thing that that's less good, and that in some ways is more tempting, is rather than trying to kind of uh, reduce the power of the courts, is just to try to uh, capture the courts as much as possible. That's kind of the court packing instinct, right? Rather than Rather than defang the court, let's just let's just put as many of our guys there as possible, and then and then we'll use all the power, and that's uh, nuclear prol- proliferation, right? Over time, we just keep trying to to push the courts more and more for our partisan views, and and until the whole thing blows up. And that does seem to be the mood on some degree on both sides, no, and with some respectable support on both sides. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing that sort of uh, that worries me about the about the future of the court. Um, and the future of the, sort of the politics of the court, right? The court can be the court can be checked by politics. So, it, in some sense, the court won't go on forever because we won't let it. Um, but whether we check the court in a in a healthy way or an unhealthy way will determine whether we still still have a court worth respecting at the end. And if different members of the court were listening to this conversation, do you think I think the Chief Justice might be nodding as you say some of these things, or maybe there's <laughs> I, some of the things I say? And how many of the other justices have any instinct towards institu- again this might be a good or an instinct some people don't approve of but it's just as an analytical matter have a kind of instinct towards i don't know what you'd call it institutional preserv- self-preservation and uh, of you know not picking too many fights at once as opposed to look this is the law and i've got four very good law clerks who were proving to me that this was what people intended at x amount of time and and here's yeah. a very important law review article that justifies this so i'm just going with it I mean, so <clears throat> I don't know. Obviously, I've never been in the in the conference room. My guess is it doesn't really like come in at the day to day level. Like you don't think, oh well, you know, Roe versus Wade is wrong, but our our approval ratings are a little low this year, so let's you know let's let's wait until uh, after the midterms. You know, I don't think the court really thinks about it that way. But I'm sure that in the kind of deeper sense, like they grapple all the time with questions about deference to Congress and precedent and liquidation and, and things like that. And I'm sure that in the deeper sense, they're kind of, their judicial philosophies are shaped by their view of, of what the role of the court should be. Um, I think that's true. And w- would you say of the current justices and more broadly, just the current judges in the country and the current respectable law professors who could become judges and so forth, um, <laughs> Where's the breakdown on that? I mean, how much, uh, how 
on both right and left, how much are we in sort of on the right, let's call it pure originalism, as opposed to prudential restraint and, you know, limit, self-limitation. And on the left, I don't know what the exact analogy would be, pure, let justice be done, as opposed to, we yeah. have to be a little careful here. Uh, I think it's too soon to tell. You know, on the right, uh, some of the, you see people, a lot of people complaining that the court court isn't going far enough. Uh, you get this whole move towards common good constitutionalism, kind of animated by the idea that the court's the court's not radical enough, that it's too captured by the the moderates uh, and, and needs to go farther. Uh, I don't think that's going to take off, but the fact that it's even a serious part of the conversation is a sign of how much things have gone wrong. And then you see people on the left say, well, look at what people on the right are saying. We would be chumps if we weren't doing the same thing. Um, so I guess I think I think we are, we're at a moment where it's it's time to try to de-escalate, um, but that's not a popular position. Uh, so I hope we can do it. Yeah, I can't see this conversation is really cheering me up as much as I had hoped, but uh, <laughs> but it's very yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, common good constitutionalism, which I guess is Adrian Vermeule and some of these other people. I mean, it's fine if you want to say that I would prefer a regime in which but elected officials did A, B, or C, or, we, or which we didn't have certain constitutional protections and separations of uh, your rights to privacy and, and so forth. But it's a little weird for me to say that this is, const this is this is like a legitimate form of constitutionalism. It's a legitimate form of political philosophy, you know? It just seems hard to, I don't know, does age, it's like, does Vermeer pretend that this is, a leg he's interpreting the constitution in a way that anyone ever intended, or is it just, this is the right outcome, so we might as well just use this current constitution to get to it? Uh, I think, I think, you know, it doesn't depend on what people would have intended. It's not a form of originalism. Um, uh, but it is, it purports to be, you know, legal interpretation. Now, I mean, I'm with you. I think the the constitutionalism part of common good constitutionalism is not really there. Uh, there's not a lot of interest or attention to the, you know, the dilemmas we've been talking about, about sort of our constitutional structures and who has what kind of power over what, um, which seems to be a big problem. I'm struck before I let you go. I mean, I, I think con the failure of Congress really is so central, isn't it, to this whole discussion and conversation, though. I mean, that of all the branches of government, I've, I've thought Congress is the most broken, and it then leads to brokenness beyond its borders. Is that a fair statement, do you think? I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, for instance, again, in the New Deal era, Congress was, you know, organized and incredibly popular, and that meant that there were limits to how much the court could uh, push back against it in the end. But for all the amount of people bellyache about the court, you know, people think even less of Congress. And then the fact that that's kind of the expectation of Congress is kind of self-fulfilling. So you know, when, when Congress wants to accomplish something, they almost have to do it uh, in secret so that we don't become too uh, polarized about it. You know, I was struck. I was in the uh, first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush administration, when uh, Justice Scalia, I believe, wrote the opinions basically saying, no, you don't get to claim a religious exemption to law, you know, to laws. Was that the I don't know, it was yeah. a, some weird Smith. case. But Smith is the name of the case, but whatever the particular thing was. But it had pretty big implications that religion wouldn't have, let's say, any special standing or whatever. Uh, you couldn't just say, I, my religious belief leads me not to want to do X. Um, and Congress did react, thinking this was, whatever the merits of it as a matter of First Amendment and constitutional interpretation, that they didn't, Congress wanted to provide more exceptions, you might say, or leeway for religious institutions, if I'm not mistaken, passed in a pretty bipartisan way, the, uh, the Religious Freedom Act, Restoration Act, whatever it was called, and what, two or three years later, I can't remember. And it feels like that's sort of how the system is supposed to work. I mean, I don't know if Scalia's opinion is, I mean, McConnell thinks it was the wrong, inter wrong interpretation of the First Amendment, whatever, but uh, the, the Congress was able to, in a sense, mute the unhappiness and, and, and arrive at an outcome, which is itself produced, of course, a lot of litigation, I suppose, over the yeah. 30 years since, but it's sort of a reasonable way of handling the situation, it seems to me, where there clearly are competing, uh, you know, imperatives and considerations, but that doesn't seem to happen much anymore. No, it doesn't. But, and then people, but people still demand change and that pushes the executive branch to do indefensible things uh, or, you know, really push the envelope. And then that puts the court in the position of having to really push back. And, you know, the constitutional system doesn't function if we only have uh, two branches, the executive branch and the courts and no legislature, but that's kind of where we are. Yeah. And if, and if they just are, and if they're just fighting with one another, as opposed to, in a sense, I don't know what the, what the term is, but you know, uh, 
reacting to one another, but in a way that leads to a you know a tenable sort of outcome uh, down the road. Um, right. I mean, I guess one thing that so let's come back to sort of concretely the next year, because I think one thing you really brought to light, which I hadn't really focused on, was just what a turbulent year it could be, just in terms of headline. I mean, leaving aside again legal doctrines almost, but in terms of headlines. And I guess another one would be: is there a pretty good chance the Supreme Court will overturn President Obama's? Uh, DACA, the, the rights for the uh, the Dreamers, so to speak. Uh, I gather I, that that's finally coming back. That, that case, case seems to come up every two years and then go away for some reason. It's never quite resolved, but isn't that finally coming back to the court? I think it is. Um, whether that was he was within his right, whether that was a matter of executive discretion or not. Uh, sort of. There are yeah. There are a set of questions about executive discretion over immigration that that don't perfectly overlap because the the you know versions of the policy keep changing, but in which, yeah, the question of are the courts going to set aside the, um, you know, the executive branch priorities are, are going to come back again and the executive branch might well, might well lose. Uh, there are some complicated jurisdictional issues too. Um, but again, this is all, you know, immigration is a huge political issue in which, uh, the courts and the executive branch are constantly going back and forth and sort of trying to work with it. And, you would think with such an issue, maybe we could at some point get some sort of political resolution. Uh, but instead, Congress just lets everybody else fight about it so they don't have to compromise. Yeah, immigration is a particularly bad case of that. I've got to, so we could have been next year, uh, the term is beginning soon, I guess, next week. I, can't, I don't know, two weeks. Um, we're talking about, what, September 28th? A um, couple of weeks, I guess. We could have a year in which the court well, rules against affirmative action programs. I don't know that that will entirely mean you could never take raise the diversity into account, but certainly throws out the current programs, right, at major universities, in which they throw out the Obama administration's, or limit it a lot, uh, executive order protecting the dreamers who are now here. Um, I assume we'll have more of the administrative law sort of uh, disputes about whether agencies have overreached in their, using their discretion in, in certain ways. Um, what am I missing? Some other big... Big, big changes in election law. The yeah, big changes, and, possible yeah. big changes in election law. We'll have issues, I guess, maybe produced by the whole Trump investigations and, you know, quote, executive privilege. And Could be. They have a case we haven't talked about about sort of asking them to throw out all of Indian law, um, which, you know, in a way may seem like a, a niche uh, issue, but <laughs> that's a big issue. Um, yeah, that one seems to cut across the normal ideological. Indeed. Uh, which can make it unpredictable. And then we have, you know, regulations of social media now bubbling up in the lower courts. Um, so, yeah, it could be a term in which it won't be, nothing will ever get the same headlines as overruling Roe, but uh, it could be a lot. Yeah, and so by a year from now, or nine, ten months from now, let's just say the summer of 23, I suppose, you could have a situation where there's real un unrest, you might say political unrest on both sides at the federal level and at the state level in some of these cases, and, and that in which the courts are sort of implicated. I mean, I don't know that they're exactly the direct object, but the kind of uh, sense of the courts increasing the instability of the system, not resolving issues. That's right. I wonder how that plays out then in a polarized environment and a, maybe a divided Congress or a Congress partly divided from the executive branch in terms of... Yeah, if you're Joe Biden facing a tight re-election campaign, it may be that vilifying the Supreme Court will be one of the you know best things for you to do. Uh, if you're Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump, you're <laughs> not exactly going to be standing up for uh, conservative uh, judicial restraint either. So it, you know, it could well uh, turn into a pretty ugly conversation. Yeah, and I mean, whatever Biden maybe is old fashioned enough not to want to go in that direction, and the commission he set up sort of took the steam out of that. But of course, if it's an open Democratic primary, uh, it could become a huge issue. Though uh, I mean, as, and we're seeing it even this year with just the fights over abortion policy, which is that's a legitimate policy question at the state level. I mean, right. do you think of the, well, just one last thing on abortion, just to get back to that, since that has been the most, the crux of it since it was the most dramatic. Uh, do you think it's, I mean, I guess I thought 20, 30 years ago, well, yeah, it really is a state issue. And people like me who didn't like Roe wanted it back to the states to be healthier. Of course, once the federal government, federal, once Congress has passed various limitations on abortion, partial birth and so forth, is it credible anymore to say that if either side prevails in Congress and the executive branch, which for now would have to be the pro, uh, the abortion rights side since Biden's president, he'd veto you know, anything, but because the only in 2025 could be the opposite, a national law to limit or ban abortion. Uh, 
Is it credible that the court might say, no, the national government doesn't have this authority, or is that kind of resolved? No, they might. They might. Uh, I mean, I think if you ask me to predict, I think the court would uphold most national regulations in either direction, uh, that Roberts and Kavanaugh would, would sort of see that as within Congress's discretion. But that's not obvious, um, you know, from the text of the Constitution or even from from some of the precedents. And of course, that's setting us up for a you know a really big democratic conflict. Right. So if, if Democrats pick up, it's hard to know how many seats you'd have to pick up because I don't think everyone's being entirely candid about the filibuster. But let's assume they could overcome filibuster issues and pass a quote codifying of Roe v. Wade, leaving aside what exactly that is. But and Biden signed it. I guess that would go right to the courts. I mean, uh, that yeah. would be a pretty massive thing if a if a conservative Supreme Court though decided, well, no, the federal government can pass laws just like the state governments can and then huge reaction on the right presumably yeah to that right yeah i mean so you know the coda to the the religious freedom restoration act story you're talking about is that it went back to the court and they struck it down um yeah uh, as applied to most of the states even though <laughs> even though it's a big national majority even though you know probably shouldn't have i forgot about that so they struck it down but then there is still a law right i mean RIFRA or whatever which yeah so it, it's struck down as applied to the states the main thing it was supposed to do was but it still applies to the federal government's own operations. So you end up with a kind of compromise. So it, you know, it governs Obamacare, but it doesn't give you rights against the state of Texas or the state of Massachusetts. So I guess when, I'm just thinking about this, this is very parochial, but a little issue I knew about here in Virginia in terms of our synagogue and certain things. But I, so I guess that was based on a state religious rights law, probably, that they, exactly. they couldn't arbitrarily limit the size of the you know congregation because the neighbors thought it was noisier than they liked on some. Uh, well, there's also special federal regulation about zoning and prisons. Those sort of got a special carve out. So, so land use and, and prisoners' rights have their own. You, know, you end up with this sort of messy tapestry of laws. But that's why the Yeshiva University case isn't just resolved under some sort of federal statute that that governs this. I see. So we could have abortion issues, election issues, uh, race issues, affirmative action, racial discrimination issues, um, administrative law issues, which could be get pretty fundamental though if they're you know on major yeah. aspects of administrative law, climate change, and so forth. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten immigration issues, all with the courts and the Supreme Court in particular, all in the mix in a yeah. pretty visible way in the next year. Never a dull moment. Yeah, that'll be good. People really do need to listen to your podcast every, every <laughs> is it every two weeks now, I think? It, you need to do it every week, you know? We, every we try to follow the courts. So when the court is quiet, we're quiet. But when a lot's going on, then we have to, we have to do it. Well, we'll have to have our own conversation here in uh, uh, early next year, or maybe certainly at the end of term, but maybe even halfway through at the rate. When, is, when are most of these things final? This is sort of trivial, but you follow this stuff uh, closely. Most of us don't. When... When do these decisions come down? They don't all get held till the end of term, right? That's, I mean. No, although more and more of them do. I think, you know, you usually get a few big decisions by by January or February, maybe. Um, and then some in April as they're sort of trying to clear the decks. But then a lot of them happen in the last, the last month. So June 2023, in the midst of it, God knows what else will be going on in the country and in the world. <laughs> we'll have a whole bunch of um, things. Not, excuse me, not quite the magnitude of Roe, but not... Not, not, not that, not, not small either, right? Exactly. Okay, something to look forward to. Well, thank you, Will, for really very illuminating, I think, conversation for those of us who don't follow this the way you do, and uh, not entirely, um, well, chastening one, but a serious one about. Uh, it would be nice if we could fix some of these problems. I mean, by just passing legislation in some of these areas, as you say, and 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 yeah. fixing some of the obvious issues, as opposed to letting it all boil to a kind of a head and have it become a massive showdown in which the court then gets implicated. Yeah, well, call your congressman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that advice. Very useful <laughs> from, from Chicago Law School. Um, <laughs> Will Bo, thank you for uh, joining me for this very interesting conversation. We'll do it again in, in less than a year, I, I think. Thank you. Sorry they're never more cheerful than this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. It's, it's, reality is important, you know. <laughs> uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, on Conversations.